that hamster and, thing coming up. Hamster. And we are live. <laughs> uh, welcome everybody out there in YouTube land. YouTube land. Saturday night, 5.30. We've been waiting. We got a nice uh, tasting going to this evening with yes. some mac and cheese. Yeah. Oh. McAllen. Yes. Cheese in Highland Park. There you go. I like that. The way you threw in mac and cheese. <laughs> but yeah. uh and and helping to get this going uh, from Aus or not Austin Dallas the Dallas area Boom. Matt Z once again uh, we'll let you guys talk Matt and Elise introduce yourselves. Perfect Matt. Hello I'm Matt Matt the Dummies down in Austin last year a juice collection of whiskey and we're having a big taste of Mac in Highland Park tonight and turn over to Elise. Yeah my name is Elise Fleckman I am the proud ambassador for the Edrington portfolio here in the state of Texas I live in Houston but I get to split my time. Uh, luckily, with fine folks such as yourselves and Matt uh, all over the state, and we are here tonight to drink two of my favorite ex or two of my favorite brands in the portfolio and multiple expressions around them uh, that we don't generally either get to see often or will be in a special sort of scenario. So we've got several different marks in McAllen, some different Highland Parks. Hopefully, uh, you all out in YouTube land can get a good enough sense of it that you feel like you're right here with us tasting it. So. You bet. Now, uh, Matt, what's going on? Though? I mean, we're doing this on YouTube, but what do you have going then? Once okay. So basically, at 7.30 here, Central Time, we're going to go downstairs. We have a huge tasting area to here, and we'll go through eight different expressions, and everybody will we'll have close to 100 people here later tasting wow. the different expressions. So then after that, we will taste a ton of other whiskey. And I know you usually have some, like, of your, your VIP group that are – Watch. Yeah, there's uh, there's like about ten people here right now. Got about behind us. Uh, let's let me go through. Spend a couple minutes here, or a couple seconds, just go through and point out some of the people that are joining us in the chat. Uh, Matthew Lynn is here. Arashnadi, Big Dog, Claire the Third, Big Dog, Travis Woolard, Jason Whiskey Wise, uh, Chad Adams, Hoyt Hempel is here. Hoyt. I'm just gonna say that. Yeah, George. George. The hype man. Amy W. Yeah. Um. Do, do do scrolling down. Now we're getting some more people in. Mark Brown is here. If I miss you, I apologize. Tom R. Mark Goins. Yeah. Once you start, you almost can't stop. Yeah. McAllen Fine and Rare. Ooh. Um. I don't know if you know who that is, Elise. I believe he actually he might work at McAllen actually. Awesome. Um. And. He has he has a role with him. I'm pretty sure. I know I was talking about Aqua Vitae's but he's uh, friend, uh, and he works at McAllen. Wow. And McAllen Fine and Rare uh, said something about it. But anyway, uh, Carl H. Boom day boom. Um, do, 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 do. Hey, George says TikTok man. Let's TikTok. go. That was right. That was it. That was before we went live. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought he meant quit saying names. Nope. <laughs> uh, the Dan Trout is here. Stephen G. Kilted Moose, L O L O, Christine Deems, Bobby Parnell, Doug Danny, Chris Oak, Frank Lampert, uh, Rue R. Freak. All right, let's roll. Dan E., Frank Lampert, Moose John, Andrew, Thomas McCrory. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Goodness. Yes, thanks for being here with us. It's phenomenal. And I was looking to see if McAllen Fine and Rare commented about if he works there or not. So, so anyway, we're going to start. McAllen Fine and Rare. <laughs> we're going to start with the, the my. The, my favorite 12 year, right? The standard McAllen 12 sherry cask. Great nose. Yes, awesome nose. So, what we have today is a fun program we've been working on, and you all at home will have an opportunity to hopefully take in what we're going to tell you today and recreate it for yourselves. The entire point of the program is to, um, you know, create ownership and, and a little bit more confidence in the idea of creating tastings or approaching things in a different manner. And what I mean to say is we're doing a tasting that we like to call mac and cheese, where we pair specific types of cheeses with different expressions of Macallan and the idea that we're going to find something out that's a bit different or we're going to experience something on our palates that maybe we wouldn't perceive without that sort of either synergic pairing or um, kind of a, you know, contrasting pairing as well. So we want to just dive right in. Yes. We're awesome. Cool. So cool. let's talk about McAllen for just a brief minute. Um, for everybody, I'll give you a background information about McAllen. Um, the distillery was established in 1824, and quite frankly, we've been strapped to um, our standards of perfection to making it in that manner as best we can. 
um, ever since. So this expression that we're trying today is sort of, if you will, the DNA or the backbone of what you can expect from the McAllen Distillery. It's uh, sort of our tried and true. Um, and it's essentially a phenomenal conversation with fine maturation and, and uh, combinations of casks. But really what we're looking at here is um, heavily um, influenced expression of whiskey that sees a ton of European oak that is sherry seasoned with Oloroso sherry. Um, and that is sort of exactly the, what we intend it to be. We're seeing a combination of casks across hogsheads, butts and punchins here, but really what we're looking for as far as flavor profile is going to be a beautiful balance between sort of those tannic expressions that we get from European oak, a lot of the tannic um, sort of dryness that we find in the finish, but also we're looking at a lot of those sweet spice notes that we find from sherry seasoning. Um, and when I say sherry seasoning, I know that there's a lot of argument or at least conversation batting back and forth about what that means when it comes to whiskeys. Um, the McAllen, we're, we're absolutely committed to um, developing the most fine and pristine flavor profiles that we can. So that means our cask um, creation and journey that our casks take before we put our new make spirit in it is, is pretty daunting and it's absolutely sort of a a nod to the commitment that our master whiskey makers um, have towards creating, arguably, again, the world's best whiskey. Um, but what that means is we are harvesting full log and lumber from areas of um, the Americas where we find American oak. So we've got Kentucky and Ohio, and we're taking full American oak lumber, shipping that to an area called Jerez de la Frontera. This is your famous sherry producing region in Spain. And we're seeing the same process happening from the north of Spain and the south of France with European oak. So once we bring this to this region in Spain, which is famous again for producing sherry, um, which will probably nod to you knowing that that's where we're gonna fill it up with sherry once the casks are created. But it goes through a bit of a process prior and it's important that we talk about it briefly just so that you all know and can have the assurance in your heart when you're trying the Macallan that there's a level of consistency and uh, sort of a commitment to perfection here. We essentially cut down these oaks, uh, different oak types into staves, staves knowing that those are the fine pieces of wood that go into the hoops to create a cask. Um, each type of wood, obviously thinking about oak as a species, it's easy to imagine that they're pretty similar in nature, but they aren't. They are very, very different in types of trees and that has a lot to do with the type of grain that they carry, the soil that they're grown in. But really what we're looking at is these two different types of oak give off very, very different flavor profiles. So we air dry our staves for two years in the lots at the cooperages before they're even constructed, which is a step beyond what we generally see with steaming um, or you know fire cooking to speed up that process. But it's important that we allow it to air dry so that it's developing the most perfect flavor profiles that we're looking for. From there, then they go into obviously cooperages. We see a lot coming out of the Tavasa cooperage which is where we have most of our casks created. And actually it's where Highland Park's casks are created as well. Um, and from there, we essentially fill these casks with dry Oloroso sherry, where they rest at the bodegas for two years. Um, two years is a pretty, pretty good amount of time um, to season a cask. And it's important really that we're doing this because essentially the story of Macallan is, it's absolutely soaked in, 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 in sort of, uh, I guess really all of it is about the sherry and sherry thinking about it. And I'm sure I'm going to ask this and see a show of hands in the room that we're in who drinks sherry. Nobody, no one raised their hand. <laughs> um, it's something that lives in literature in our grandmother's, you know, liquor cabinet. And that's as far as it gets with us. I'm, I've been fortunate in my studies of spirits to try a lot of sherry's. I love sherry and usually I'm drinking it alone. Um, but <laughs> the thing about it is thinking about that as consumers and, and, and drinkers is it's probably a dwindling industry. Um, so it's really important for the McAllen and for Highland Park to create partnerships with these sorts of um, professionals in the industry so that we can help them continue doing what they're doing because without Sherry, we will no longer be able to exist. So we rest it for two years and then we, we remove the Sherry and we give it back to these bodegas. So if you want to say it's maybe a crass way of thinking of it, but it's important that we understand we're essentially renting it. Um, and we do so so that we can then give it back they can bottle it however they'd like, add value to their, their home and their programs and continue to existing so that we can remain, uh, you know, creating the whiskey that we do. So from there, we ship these casks by sea all the way up north, either, uh, you know, roughly 2,000 miles to either uh, the highlands where McAllen is made or even further up to Orkney where we fill with Highland Park. Um, and that's sort of the general gist of what the casks go through. And it's important to know that because again, the oak is really what we focus on with the McAllen. And when we talk through these, we'll see why that's important. But what we have here is a 12. Uh, one thing real quick though, at least that I didn't realize early on, like you, 
reading between the lines of what you just said, you guys, you McAllen creates your own sherry casks. We do. You're not, you're not going to the sherry industry and buying casks like some distilleries are. No, and and it's um to brag a bit, and it's important also that we know some of the value that's added to the bottle and why our our whiskeys price points uh, um, are you know reflected as they are is that it's a painstaking and expensive process. We spend ten times the industry standard um, when it comes to sourcing our wood, crafting our casks, seasoning those casks, and then managing those casks based on sort of the um, the requirements of our master and whiskey makers. And we're also the only Scotch company that actually has a headquartered office in Jerez de la Frontera, where we um, employ our own employees to help build those relationships, maintain those relationships on the ground in Spain so that we know what's happening. We can support the bodegas and the cooperages as needed. And outside of our industry or actually our company, we're, you know, second-handedly employing about 150 to beyond employees in the Jerez de la Frontera region. So it's important that we're reinvesting in this community and we're actually being a very big pivotal part in the creation and the maintenance of what's happening there. And how long have you worked with Edrington? Uh, it'll be two years on June 18th. So have you been have you been to that area of Hareth that you're talking about? I haven't been to Hareth. Um, I've studied Spanish in, in school, and so I went to um, Madrid for a bit, and I've tried my hand at a lot of sort of um, more well-known areas, Barcelona as well, and I went to speak Spanish. I failed miserably, as we know. <laughs> Learning Spanish in Mexico or near Mexico in Texas here is very different than Spain, so I came home a little bit disappointed realized that I had missed an entire pocket of magic and I have every intent to go back. Like I said, I do enjoy Sherry, so I'm sure it will be nice to find some other people in the world there maybe that drink it with me. I like that, a pocket of magic. It is, yeah, a little special place. You know, it's something that I'll say and I'll probably repeat myself today is the thing that really got me into whiskey and I hope everybody here appreciates this as well is that any bottle that's sitting behind us or behind you two or Anything that you see in the store is a sliver of anthropology, really. It's it's an opportunity to see the world, um, to recognize that there are people in places around the world that are doing something that we can inherently either get to know or educate ourselves in or love and continue to share with our friends. So it's something I'm passionate about. And yeah, I would love to get to Hareth. So maybe we can all plan a trip. Yeah. Awesome. There you go. Now, and you had a good point as well when you asked everybody who drank who drinks. Um, Very good point, Sherry. Sherry. It, to, to help support sherried scotches and make these casks available. We, really we should. all should mm -hmm. be drinking. Yeah, you know what? You're all tasked now. It's your homework to down a <laughs> bottle of sherry a week if you can, Oloroso <laughs> specifically, because that's what we're using. But I think sherry's just misunderstood. It's sort of something like Riesling or some wines. You know, there's a spectrum to them. They're not that one thing that we've seen. And a lot of times with sherry, we see only sherry that's like cream sherry or dessert mm -hmm. sherries. And so we get yep. kind of turned off from it when in actuality there's an entire range. What we're talking about here with Oloroso sherry is it's a very secco or dry sherry. Um, and it's it's nutty and it's flavorful. So it's, it's sort of like you can't judge a book by its cover. You can't judge the entire sherry line from whatever that one person offered you a long time ago, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you've been talking about picking up some Oloroso sherry for a while. Yeah. So, uh, well, we can talk about sherry uh, offline. Yeah. We'll this tasting. So, I'm going to knock you out with just six key points when it comes to McAllen's um, production that are going to be easy kind of keystones or touch points to understanding the method that we make our whiskey and sort of the, again, the sort of commitment and determination to perfection here. Um, and the first is our spiritual home. And we can see on both of these bottles, there is a small emblem of a home or a house. That is what we call Easter Elkies Manor. It was a Jacobian manor that was built in the year 1700. It still stands and functions as a hosting space at the McAllen at the estate. And it's sort of a motif or a symbol for, again, that sort of commitment to perfection, endurance, and, and um, preservation, really. So from that, we then talk about sort of our curiously small stills. Um, we've recently revamped um, our production. We've rebuilt our distillery to be a better hosting site. Um, and with that, we went from 14 stills to 16, or to add six, I think six more or seven more. So we have 21 in total, but these stills are all copper. Um, they're, they're very small when it comes to volume. So they hold a charge of about 4,000 liters, just shy of 3,900. Um, and what that means is we're this sort of I mean, in our minds, we're this behemoth of sorts. We're this huge, iconic brand, and we imagine that we're probably operating in this, you know, rough, almost 
sterile sort of situation where it's a little bit more of a factory uh, than it is a, a, a place where you can make something magical, but um, we, we very well aren't. So these copper pot stills are very important because what we know about copper is the relationship that it has with the vapors in distillation is it doesn't allow in our, our arms as well. Um, the way that the, the stills are, are built is a sort of, it, it allows us to have less reflux. So we're actually grabbing more particulates in distillation. So more flavor profiles are able to make itself into the second container where we're able to kind of um, harvest more flavor profiles. Something else about a copper is it allows the new make spirit to develop this sort of viscous, oily nature, which is incredibly important in the Macallan. We know that we see the 12 year here in front of us. We're going to be tasting up um, through some older expressions, I think we've got a 15. But really what we what we intend to do is when we see even older expressions, something like the 25, or even to the into something um, that sees even more uh, age, something like maybe the Macallan M, where we have seven combinations of casks. You're seeing whiskey that is asked to you know, be in relationship with oak that's incredibly influential for at least 12 years. So if we don't begin with a very rich and viscous um, sort of new make spirit, then it's not going to stand up to the oak. So when we look at our whiskey, obviously, um, we can see that it's got, we talk about it like legs and wine, it's sort of oily. Um, and even more so than that, which brings us to our third point, is um, our cut. We take a very, very fine cut. So off of this still, um, rather than grab everything between the heads and the tails that we can in order to create more whiskey, we're only taking 16% of that cut. We're ensuring that everything is as rich and flavorful and perfect as we can. And I love it so much. I'm helping myself to Scott's. Oh, you know, get into it. Scott, we'll get you a new one. Don't worry. I always like to say, especially with the Macallan, the bottle itself is a celebration. If you've got it, drink it. Yeah. I might need I might need one just so I stay away from your stash, is all I'm saying. Yeah, you should have brought a little a little side holster or something. Maybe you can give me a new bottle later. But then we go into um, our fourth kind of pillar, and that is our exceptional oak casks, which I mentioned to you all again. We're looking at a combination of something like 16 different types of casks when it comes into type of wood, uh, vessel size, volume, those sorts of things. But from there, we then talk about another point that's incredibly important, and we're gonna see it and talk about it again as we go through these three different expressions. Is it 100% of our color? and 80% of our flavor is coming from that wood. So then that's gonna be our natural color. It's not illegal to add a caramel colorant when we're talking about single malts that are coming to the United States, um, but it is a point of pride for us that we have whiskey masters and blenders that are capable of creating consistent um, product on a day-to-day -day basis, despite um, fluctuation and things like thermal lag even, or you know the happenings in climate that maybe add some variance when it comes to uh, color. Um, so 100% of your color is natural and 80% of your flavor profile is coming from that. And again, that's kicking it back to what the wood does to the flavor of the whiskey and, and aging. And then sixth, which I particularly enjoy, is if we're doing all of these things the way that we should, which is as the best of our ability in the manner in which that we did in 1824, then we will be creating a peerless spirit. So the sixth pillar is that the Macallan is peerless in its nature. It is It stands out from every other whiskey in its field, um, so it truly can't be met. So with that being said, we're trying our 12 year. I know that I'm getting thirsty from talking. You're getting thirsty from listening. So let's get right into it. There are Bart, some Bart isn't. He is already on his second glass. I'm <laughs> pouring liberally. Something about you got a holster. <laughs> You're going to get a holster for your whiskey that you need to bring with you so you can keep giving yourself little, little drams. So we have Macallan 12. This is our backbone of our sort of the DNA of what we expect to find, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to tilt it. We're looking at it. Um, beautiful, direct, natural color. Uh, we can see it kind of climb down the glass. That's going to be sort of another nod to that um, cut, that perfect 16% cut that we're taking from distillation. Um, and then we, we smell it. Let's smell it. Yeah? I'll just, just give it a good swirl. Warm her up. Oh, yeah. So immediately I'm getting a lot of um, sort of oily citrus. Lots of sort of fruits, but dried almost. Right, we're getting some little bit brighter, like apricots maybe. I get, I get yeah, I get a lot of raisins, but you get some vanillas, some sweetness. Um, maybe it's more of a butterscotch for some people, but those vanillins are in there. Um, and, and then Matt, yeah, Matt obviously you've got the same too. Matt needs to pour some more. Yeah, that's true. I can see it. <laughs> I'm just Matt needed an excuse to get him some more. Yeah, I need some more in his glass. Let's give oh, it a let's give it a taste. Mm. It's like Claire the Third. He needs an excuse to give me a hard time. I have saw that in the comments, Claire. I saw it. <laughs> Immediately sweet and robust on our palate, right? We've got those sherry spices. And when I say that, 
sure you've heard it a million times. I don't want it to be one of those things that we listen to rattled off to us without understanding sort of sommelier speak when we're li listening to people talk about tastings. The sherry spice notes that I'm talking about are sort of those cinnamons, allspice, nutmeg. Sometimes we get a little bit of star anise or anisette and that's very much present here. And we're getting that from, again, those European sherry seasoned oak casks that make up the the majority of what we're seeing here with our classic 12. There is a, um, a sprinkling of American oak that is blended in or harmoniously married there at the end, but that's simply just trying to curb some of those really robust complexities, it's kind of mellow it out and make it a little bit more palatable. Um, and what we have here again today is a mac and cheese. So we're doing a little bit something special. Yes. And what we're pairing here with this is going to be a Gruyere. Um, a Gruyere is um, an alpine cheese. It's got a nutty kind of a nature. It's going to be milky and creamy as well. But the importance of this exercise, if you can take this note, is to make a whiskey sandwich. So we're going to take a sip of our whiskey. Okay. We're going to take a bite of our cheese, and then we're going to revisit our whiskey to see what actually happens to the spirit in this pairing. Um, and while you go are, ahead and do that, because I've done it a million times. like your legs, milky and creamy. Milky and creamy, like Scott's <laughs> legs. Yeah. That was also for Claire. Because Claire, I saw your comment again. Mm. What you, what's Claire asking for? Like Claire, Claire is giving me a hard time because he knows he knows I like to run the show. And he's like, look, someone that 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 won't let Bart run the show. I'm like, yes, that is right. <laughs> so we have our Gruyere, we have our sherry, right? We have our sherry whiskey. Mm. And so what we want to try to see is what we, we either find new about the whiskey when we revisit it after this cheese is kind of um, rested on our palate a bit and what flavor profiles are a little bit maybe more pronounced or cut through. What I would call this pairing is something like a synergic or a complementary pairing. They're not necessarily, one isn't eclipsing the other in flavor. What we're going to see here is sort of a complement. Um, the richness of this cheese, the nuttiness, um, the sort of flavor of the salinity of it even as well. There's a sweetness to it too. Um, it's gonna be sort of similar to that that we find in the whiskey. So I think that they make a really nice compliment, but let me just try it out in case I'm wrong. I've done this a million times, but one more won't hurt. Mm, no, that's good. It has a uh, very nice. The fact is I need the whiskey on the, I need the, I need the whiskey sandwich. Right sandwich. Here. Whiskey sandwich. Mm. That's a unique cheese. So, Are you doing this, Matt? I am. He's doing it. What do you think? It definitely pushed back some of the oaky quality. I think that it cuts the finish a bit, but nothing that isn't going to bring us back to the glass. But I think that it really enhances a lot of the vanillas and the custards that we're looking for here in this in this expression. Um, the spice is still present; it's just not as pronounced. What we do kind of see take a back burn is um, a back burner is the the citrus. We don't see so much of the bright citrus notes. We're really getting kind of more of the dessert flavors coming through. I that think is that's true. I mean, this is very interesting. I actually haven't. Uh, I don't even know if I've tried this particular cheese before. So it's an interesting mix that's yeah. going on here. Yeah, right? Nathan, Nathan Whiskey Wise is asking what kind of cheese it is. This is a Gruyere. Yeah, it's a young Gruyere, which is a, an Alpine cheese. So it's a Swiss cheese. It's essentially a cow's milk cheese. It's going to have more of a nutty kind of a character. There's some salinity to it, but it also opens up depending on the type that you get and the age of it as well into some really sweetness or some sweet kind of flavor profiles, which I think complement the 12 year double or sherry oak very, very well. Hmm. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, going back in. Price going for two. Yeah. Oh no, no. Just uh, that yeah. one was in. What? Oh, you wanted another one? I'm yeah, it tastes very like custard now. It changed into yeah, but like it's like almost like a nice custard in your glass. Very yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. And when I really enjoy this, especially with the sherry oak, it's kind of become my after dinner McAllenite. There are other expressions that are available now that are a little bit lighter because of the American oak presence and maturation that I don't necessarily need. Say I'm eating a cuisine that's a bit lighter in flavor profile that maybe wouldn't appreciate the sherry richness of this expression. It's a phenomenal kind of after dinner treat. So if you're gonna skip dessert, I like to say I drink my dessert often, throw in some cheese with it, makes mm, sense. I like the way you talk. I will say it almost turns uh, the Macallan into a uh, like a more like a coconut vanilla cream pie. Really? Yeah, that's awesome. I like that. It's, it might be interesting to try with the um, what was called the Fine Oak series. We're now calling Triple Cask. The juice is the same. The name has changed for just a cohesive conversation when we're talking about these oak cask maturations. Um, so the Fine Oak series or the Triple Cask range actually does have a lot of those coconut kind of paradise flavors, right? We're seeing a little bit more tropical fruits in that. So. And the thing about this exercise is, yes, we make suggestions for types of cheese, but in no way are you ever wrong. I love to say that in tastings, especially, is what do we smell? 
our olfactory sense is completely subjective based on our kinetic experiences. So maybe you're recalling something and you can pinpoint something that others can't. You're never wrong. So in that same sense, you're going to find a, um, a conversation to be had with whatever you're pairing with your cheeses. But we do have a phenomenal mac and cheese guide available online. It kind of gives you the ins and outs of how to have a party, how to host your friends, how to store, slice, keep cheese, what cheeses to pair with it. So the limits are endless. We do make suggestions. But the idea is that we're, you know, kind of creating a familiar area for people to enjoy two things that I, I love. I love cheese. Do you yeah, love cheese? Absolutely. The reason we're doing it really is because when we think about cheese and whiskey, what are their similarities? They're both you know, made from really only four things, um, but it, it's sort of a mastered field. It's something that takes uh, a lot of time and commitment to creating, but it's also something that's, you know, embedded in uh, time-honored tradition and heritage as well. So the partnership and the types of products here is, is just, it's kismet. It's perfect. Mm, so, it's uh, I love it. and it's also, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword. I found myself drinking a lot of whiskey and eating a lot of cheese. So, Naturally, I've got to wedge in a little bit more time for a cycling class oh, here and there. I like the wedge. You worked in a cheese reference. Yeah, you like that? <laughs> yes, and Santa like Cruz and says he is getting, uh, he said, damn, I'm getting hungry. Yeah. Aww. He needs some cheese. He needs some cheese. Real quick, too, someone asked, if, if you came in later, uh, joining That's us from point. Dallas. Yes. Uh, the man in blue on the right is Matt. Matt. Matt is hosting a tasting tonight at his house. Mm -hmm. Joining him is Elise. Elise is a brand ambassador for uh, Edrington Group, mainly focusing on McAllen and Highland Park, uh, which is what we're going to take a look at tonight, along with some cheeses. That's we right. just did uh, the the classic McAllen Twelve Sherry Cask with the Gruyere. So I think we are ready to move on. Let's boogie, let's do it. So now we've got our double cask 12 years. So what we're doing here is we're gonna try side by side um, three different 12 years, right? Yes. Gentlemen, you've got the 12 year uh, triple cask, is that right? Yeah, um, no, we do not have the triple cask, just the 12 double. Yeah. Okay. No. So we are, we're gonna do the double cask 12 year here into our glass. This is one of my newest, uh, newest babies we released this in 1718 this was a conversation with a higher proportion of american oak and maturation that's your answer to the double cask what are your double casks this is the first time i know i mentioned that we do see a, a proportion of american oak within our sherry oak range however this is the first time that we're really having a conversation around it so what we're seeing here visually and this is important is the color changes a bit right remember what we talked about with the mccallum being 100 percent natural color 80 percent of your flavor is there as well from the casks but those different types of oak, whether it's American or European, they're imparting not only flavor, but color. So European oak, think about it as a sponge because it's a loose grain tree, will absorb more spirit and maturation. It's also going to push more of that spirit back in, roll on itself. So we're seeing higher tannins, higher flavor profiles and different complexities, but also that richer color. So when we see the double cast next to the 12 year, um, traditional sherry oak. We'll, we'll get it back when we can. It's important to notice there's a variance in color and that's going to tell you everything you need to know about what kind of a whiskey drinker are you and what Macallan is right for you. If you're a bourbon drinker or an American whiskey drinker or maybe even um, an Irish whiskey drinker, you will love the double cask. So it's basically what I call my poolside Macallan. I don't think it needs any dilution. I don't think it needs any churching up, if you will. Um, it's really kind of very palatable and you can smell on the nose pretty immediately those changes in flavor profile. Well, I pick up immediately those vanillins of that the, that American whiskey, uh -huh. right? It's sort uh -huh. of been trained um, to drink. You know, every cocktail that has whiskey in it is probably a bourbon or a blended American whiskey. It's something that through our, our history, especially with prohibition, has been sort of the training wheels for our palates as American drinkers. So it was important for the Macallan, especially when we're talking about sharing this perfect whiskey with more of the world. Um, if certain people aren't capable at that point in their, you know, their scotch journey or their investigation, and they need to sort of tiptoe into the pool rather than go off the deep end like I do, uh, this is perfect for you. So I, will say I love that. I need to church up Scott. That's what needs to happen. I church in here needs you need up. some churching up. So what do you what do you guys uh, get on the nose? What do you take? What are you smelling? Or definitely those vanillas. Yeah, some more bright citrus, fresh citrus, like a citrus juice, not the the peel where the oil lives, but more of the flesh, right, where the juice and the sugars are. There's some really fresh fruits on this one. Spices like cinnamon. We lose a lot of that rich clove, allspice, yeah. nutmeg that we that we generally receive from that European oak cask. Let's taste it. 
It's a lot lighter, a lot more citrusy, a mm -hmm. lot sweeter, lighter, sweeter. Yeah, it's not as heavy viscosity. It isn't. It's it's a, and that's what I mean. It's my pool side. I don't need to set it on ice. It doesn't need too much dilution. It's pretty perfect. Yeah, it's really cool. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a great tool, you know, we, we, as enthusiasts or as, you know, whiskey and, and scotch specific lovers, it's difficult. We're almost at a bit of margin. People don't have such an easy time experiencing, um, you know, these whiskeys the same way that we have. If we've flexed our palate a bit over time, we're capable of tasting, trying newer things with more flavor. This is perfect for anyone that's trying Macallan for the first time that wants to get equal parts kind of um soft pillow and sherry seasoning so i do like brian calfee he has said the church of pete he's speaking uh. my language there <laughs> just so you know i'm generally the pete head now i like sherry and everything scott is really loves the sherry but you dabble into the pete as well yes yeah i i like them both i don't think there's a scotch i would kick out of bed but Ooh. we'll see now uh one thing i wanted to talk about earlier too just when we were on the classic 12 is for those that don't know that are watching and uh, we are at, we have 117 people watching right now. Thanks mm -hmm. everybody that's tuning in. Thank you. But the like the, the, the McAllen 12 Sherry Cask or Sherry Oak is 12 years exclusively matured in that Sherry Oak. Mm. Um, unlike, you know, some uh, that'll do a double casking where it would spend, say, 10 years in an ex-bourbon cask and then two years in a Sherry. Right. Uh, most of your McAllen's, I think, outside of the triple cask line, are all exclusively matured for their life in the sherry casks. Yes, and honestly, it's a really good point that you're making is that we do see a combination of casks with age statements. It's important with the Macallan to know that when it has an age statement on it, it means that that whiskey rested for the entire time in its exclusive barrel. So when we talk about, or I'm sorry, cask rather, barrels are, we know, uh, whatever, details. Uh, <laughs> when, when we say 12 year double cask, it means that if we had two casks here and one was made of American oak and the other was European oak, they age next to one another for 12 entire years. And then we harmoniously blend them. So we're essentially marrying those two casks in stainless steel vats where they're rested for a little bit more time, falling into solution with one another, really kind of getting their vibe on. This is when we dilute down to proof as well. So it's, it's important to know that you're not getting uh, you know, tricked into believing that this is something that it's not. Um, that again is a kickback to how much time and, and really effort is put into creating these sorts of whiskeys. Um, but if we're at home and we're trying this and we want to try this with cheese, we have a young Manchego cheese here. Nice. Now real quick, Matt, Moose 76 says he would have fought you for that bacon and it'd be gone if he was at your house right now. Well, we have, we have so like much buckets bacon. and buckets of bacon. We're good. What was buckets it? and buckets of bacon. That is good. Moose 76 may contact you somehow on the side chat. Yeah, apparently there's four pounds of bacon that were brought over. Four pounds of bacon, wow. We'll, give, we'll proportion out the drippings and we'll send them out to whoever's watching. That's for bird dog. <laughs> so we're pairing this expression, a lighter expression of the Macallan with a, a lot more sort of um, bourbon-esque flavor profiles, right? Or American whiskey flavor profiles. We're pairing it with a young Manchego. We've got a four month old Manchego here. Manchego is a sheep's milk cheese from the La Mancha region of Spain. So we're kind of tying back to Spain. We have Reth where sherry is made. We have the Mancha region where cheese is made. So there's sort of that, you know, harmonious conversation there as well. But this cheese is traditionally a little bit more dry, but salty. It's creamy as well. It's going to essentially cut through with this expression of whiskey. It's going to cut through some of those um, oak flavor profiles and some of maybe the spice, and it's going to leave a little bit of the sweetness for us to enjoy there afterwards. So do your whiskey sandwich. We've got our whiskey sandwich in the works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. I got all kinds of like spices. Hmm. I need to do that again. Yeah, it cuts through that oak. A little bit of the citrus goes away. We're left with the sweetness and the spice, which I think is nice. I, and what I've experienced with cheese pairing is that, wow. that creamy milkiness of any cheese it's gonna kind of coat our palate and it's going to cut our long lingering finish that we generally experience with the Macallan, which isn't always a bad thing. Honestly, when I drink things like, we have something here called uh, the Port Charlotte Brugladi, when we're talking about certain whiskeys mm. that have maybe a salinity or a, a level of salt is introduced to our palates, it just has us coming back for more. So a shorter finish doesn't necessarily mean you're not enjoying it to its extent. It just means you need to bring your glass back to your mouth a little bit sooner. Mm. Yeah, you bring up the Port Charlotte, I'm gonna get distracted. 
<laughs> Stay on focus. We're on track. Get your blinders on, Bart. We are talking to Callum. I was like, PC-10, PC-10, where's it at? You know, we're here today to talk about two amazing whiskeys, but it doesn't change the fact that I, like you, we all love anything brown in a bottle. And so it's no, important, no. especially when we're talking about beautiful whiskeys, to complement uh, what is available to us. It's it's It wouldn't be the same conversation if the landscape had less. So it's important 100%. to appreciate our friends and neighbors. Um, I dabble, you know, when I need a palate cleanser, I'll pick something else up, but, you know. You bet. So any questions on the double cask? Any any kind of anything that you gentlemen have seen? I know it's a newer expression of Macallan. It's maybe a little misunderstood, but do we kind of understand where we're going at or what we're trying to do here? We're essentially opening the doors to creating more expressions of Macallan for everybody. So if we can think about Macallan being this sort of iconic thing, um, we want to create a more inclusive opportunity for people to enjoy our products. So McAllen Double Cast, again, it's sort of a recruitment uh, effort to get people that maybe generally wouldn't enjoy a sherry bomb into the category and happy. So there we are. Well, and even, you know, we did them side by side and I got a little bit of the the, McAllen, the regular sherry oat McAllen 12 here. They're really, they're very similar. Uh, you just, the, the, the sherry cask, 12 year, a little bit more of those darker Oloroso notes show the raisins and the figs uh, with a double cask. You just get a little, little bit more citrus sweetness and it's just toned down a little bit. Now we yeah. probably need to explain something we call cowbell. And uh, when we get a super chat in, hello, we got a super chat in. Sometimes they're paired with a question. We always need more cowbell. Yep. More Absolutely. cowbell. But it is a uh, BB Bull 200. Oh. Uh, it's the voice of God. Uh, I figured he might be there. He says, no question, right. just a shout out to the yeah. channel, to McAllen and to Matt for the awesome event. And then I think he said, although it's not spelled out, that There's he really loves God. Matt. He's close. Oh, oh, Wait. say it again. This is Brian, the voice of God. Wow, there <laughs> he is. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Bam. Look at Thank that. Thank you. On screen, baby. Yeah, we have a room full of phenomenal individuals here today, so I, uh, I'm lucky to be in such great company, and that extends to both of you gentlemen and all of you watching. Thank you all for being here with us again. Thank you. Um, well, a quick okay. shout out from us. Anyway, I know Josh Galladay is coming up from Austin with his wife, part of the tribe. Yeah, he's on his way. Yeah, not there yet? Not yet. He left Iron Root late. All right. Mm. Well, that's a oh, good, good yeah, reason for that. Reason. Yeah, licorice is on here as well. Here, I don't know if we can say the same for the whiskey. Mm. Okay, next we've got uh, the triple cask 15. Is that right? Yep. Do it. Awesome. Bart's on his fifth glass already. Bam. <laughs> <laughs> Get it, Bart. And I'm going to put this out here just to, for everyone's anticipation with um, what we were just talking about. Is new to our line is also a 12-year mark of the triple cask range. This is exciting because we now have an opportunity to try three different cask combination conversations in one age statement. So what we can identify this is what's our control 12 years. What are our variables, our cast combinations. So this is really giving you an opportunity to take some ownership in your palate. What is it that you're attracted to? What do you like and how do you experience it? Trying these three 12 side by side is an opportunity that we haven't been given before with the McAllen so we can finally try to see exactly what that oak is doing. But we're stepping up on the ladder of age. We're going out to the 15 uh, triple cask, which was tri it was previously called fine oak. So if there's some confusion there, we've just gotten some new packaging, beautiful new bottles. And with that, we are unveiling some new projects and that includes the fine or the triple cask 12. But what we have here is the 15 year. And I wanted to put the 12 out there as well for you all to see that the, 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 color of the whiskey is very, very similar, but if we set them all three side by side, we will see sort of a Goldilocks spectrum of, you know, color. One is incredibly dark, the other one is just right in the middle, and one is very light. And the one that's very light is here, this is our fine oak, or our triple cask expression of McAllen. And I'm trying to smudge that one up. Yeah. Trying to make noise. Uh, by the way, for those watching, I have a 394, 395, 396. And three nine seven. Boom. What you what is that oh, I got four eight seven. Yeah, it's four eighty nine. Yep. Nice. Frank Lampert has said he would love for you to come to Wichita sometime, or at least for the. I next would love to come to Wichita. Oh, no. I actually live on a street called Wichita, and I have to say all the time, like like Kansas, Wichita. So oh. if if he's got some recommendations for where I should stay and where I should drink, I'm happy to come up and help him. Uh, I'd love to get to 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 Kansas soon. So. 
Frank is part of it, one of the one of the Wichita whiskey clubs. Yeah. Uh, a good one. They do some good tasting, some have some good meetings and stuff. So awesome. Um, at the end of this, I'm gonna go ahead and like flash, if possible, a business card of mine that has some of my direct contact information for anyone that's listening or excited about it. Um, please reach out to me at any time. You know, the the thing that brings me back to my enjoyment of my job is that I get to have phenomenal conversations with great people. So uh, that is definitely a massive passion. So don't be shy, get to know me beyond this experience. Um, but what we have here is our triple cask, 15 year. Triple cask, what's triple cask, Elise? Great question. <laughs> um, we talked about our sherry oak range, right? Which is a high, high proportion of European oak, a little bit of sprinkled American oak for balance. We moved into our double cask, which is essentially a much higher proportion of American oak than we traditionally see. The sherry uh, season casks take a back burn here and let the American oak shine. And what we see here is probably a conversation about those two casks with the introduction of a third. And I think that we all here can probably guess what that is. Anyone? Uh, we were actually looking at a comment here. Sorry well, about that. Well, we, got, was a we were waiting to do a cowbell. Yeah, we didn't so want to. I missed. We didn't want to over cowbell you, yeah. but you might as well cowbell now. Nice Tom Mara has a cowbell. You got a cowbell. We Hit got it. a pause. We All got right. a break. Cowbell, baby. Sorry. Sorry. Tom. No, no. Tom R. <laughs> can, you, can you ask if she knows if the next wave of exceptional cask, the McAllen, will be coming soon? It is coming soon. Keep your eyes peeled. Um, we've got a small but enough amount coming to the state, and we see a range of casks um, that are phenomenal. And honestly, for the second range, and for anyone that's not um, familiar with this range, the exceptional single casks are just that. They are exceptional bottlings of single cask expressions. On the bottle itself, you have the cooperage um, and the cask information for identity, but you also have the bodegas of sherry and those sorts of things. You have your cask combinations, whether it's exclusively hog head, hogs heads or butts and punchins as well. It's an incredibly informative bottle and packaging, and even more so, it holds phenomenal liquid. So with that being said, keep your eyes peeled for it. It will find itself in the, probably the more um, fine and rare ca uh, cases in our favorite uh, retailers. But uh, the thing about this next wave, and I, I'm very excited about it as well, is that it's a little more price point approachable. We see the first kind of cask um, introducing itself at a, at a price that's somewhere along the lines of what we would see for maybe the rare cask and then jumping up from there. So this is the first time I think that we're seeing something so coveted available to, you know, a nice. ample pockets. So nice. good use of it's the, on the horizon. Good use of the cowbell. Way to work in the question. Sorry. Right. Now we can Back to it. So yes. we have two types of casks here. We have American oak sherry season. We have European oak sherry season. There's a third cask incorporated to this expression. What could it possibly be? Ooh, ooh, he's ooh, got it. Got. Ex bourbon. You got it, buddy. Boom. Not just any ex bourbon. I think it's important. And what we've realized here is that we make strategic partnerships with phenomenal products. We are sourcing our casks that are ex-bourbon from Heaven Hill Distillery. I was just talking to Matt. My favorite bourbon at the moment is Henry McKenna Tenure. You're also seeing Elijah Craig coming out of here. So Ooh, love the Elijah. It's a really great kind of partnership. I find pride in it as an American that loves drinking bourbon, specifically from that uh, distillery. So we're seeing bourbon casks implemented here. And what do we know about bourbon casks in, in secondary seasoning or secondary maturation is it, it doesn't give off a lot of flavor profile. And also those casks are treated differently, right? When we talk about toasting casks for sherry seasoning uh, or for scotch whiskey versus American whiskeys and bourbons is we don't talk about it like a char. When we apply fire to wood, we're changing its composition scientifically, right? So um, we are essentially creating uh, sugars and almost a charcoal. It acts almost as like a filtration system for the whiskey. So when we incorporate ex bourbon barrels, although they are retreat, uh, retreated when we have them, um, it adds a secondary flavor, a third, a third part flavor here. So if we think about it as a pie chart, we've got uh, two slices that are American oak. One is ex bourbon, the other is American oak that's sherry seasoned, and then our third slice of pie is European oak that's sherry seasoned. Ooh, now we've got it. We're going to be ringing a bell, but before that happens, no enemies here is Dan Pancaldi, our music man, but ring this bad boy. Hello, more cowbell. We got Mark Brown coming in. Bart. Oh, oh, sorry. This is actually in a question form meant for me to even say. Bart wants to know 
when he gets some Pete. No, not yet. There's some Pete coming. It's up, coming maybe. later. A little okay, influence. Stuart, okay, don't rush us, Mark. You're good. Uh, you're good. Hey, when they cowbell, though, we got to give them what they want. That's all I'm saying. Actually, we don't really see Pete in the McAllen. It's something that we do with certain expressions of release. We've seen the end black coming out. One thing that is exciting oh, about Pete in the history of McAllen is uh, one of my favorite stories. It's a non sequitur, but a side story is. The McAllen M, that very, very coveted expression in the 1824 series, it's, it's comprised of only seven casks. The casks dating back to the 1940s. The most recent cask is 1991. The cask from the 40s, this is kind of trailing back to where I say there's a slice of anthropology or a cultural study in every bottle. The, slice, or the cask from the 40s was actually um, created and, and, and cast during a wartime effort for World War II. And what happens mm. in industries is we end up giving our, um, our materials to the war effort. So we didn't have any chart or we didn't have any uh, coal at the time and we didn't have any lumber at the time. So we found this beautiful pocket by circumstance and necessity where we were peating our barley at the McAllen. So one of the casks mm. in the McAllen M is peated. It does give a nice leathery, oaky sensation. But mm. outside of that, we generally don't talk about peat with the McAllen. Sorry. Oh, I, I know those leather ones. Northern brothers, and that is the Highland Park. Mm. But, well, and, yeah. The one McAllen that I thought of, and Jason Whiskey Wise just pointed out, is the rare cast mm. black, which I, yeah. I'd yeah, like so when we see the black expressions, you're seeing a higher proportion of peat. It's not unknown to us that there's probably, probably during the time that we shut the distilleries down for cleaning, the last couple of weeks, maybe we'll do some innovative runs or some experimental mm. runs and we see some peat. Um, I can't speak on that. Uh, that kind of exercise at the distillery because I haven't been there to witness it. But what we're seeing is a new implementation of some peated barley going into these expressions that are a little more well known. Very uh, nice. Very nice. That, we don't really generally talk about it, but that's okay. So we have our fine oak or our triple cask 15. I'm saying both names in case you were a longtime whiskey drinker. You're going to be able to understand that these are the same thing. Um, when we move into the future, the bottles look different. The names are different. The juice Love is the, the same. future. If you, yeah, ginger heavy, right? So let's get right into it. It's much lighter in color. This is going to be that higher proportion of American oak, like we talked about with European oak being a loose grain sponge, absorbing more spirit. American oak being tight grained is not going to absorb much of the spirit and maturation. So that, that conversation with color isn't really as heavy with our European oak. So especially with our bourbon barrels or ex bourbon barrels, we're seeing a much lighter color given the flavor profile changes as well. And what we're looking at here is an even further step into the conversation of creating McAllen's for everybody. This is definitely going to be for your bourbon drinkers. This is going to be for people maybe that don't even know that they enjoy scotch yet. Maybe they're new to whiskey as a field. I think that this is also an expression. I know black to me might be called but if you're making a drink at home and it's a cocktail this is a great mixing one this is something that's a little bit more malleable in the sense that most of the cocktails with whiskey that we drink see bourbon or american whiskey so it's a good substitute a good add-in makes a I, cure highball i can tell look at a map he yeah. does not put it in a cocktail he wants it neat. <laughs> Matt, for any of you cocktail enthusiasts out there just do it there you go. There's nothing wrong with that. But I could tell right away Matt was like, uh oh, I'm drinking this so, meat, baby. When we talk about McAllen, we talk a lot about what it is and not how to drink it. And I think that it's important as someone that's been a bartender for a long time. I would show up to work not with the intent to tell somebody how to do the thing they wanted to do, but to give them exactly what they wanted. So as long as you're not mixing chocolate milk with it, I'm not going to call you. It's going to be fine. Put whatever you'd like in it as long as you are getting the experience that you want from the product that we create. That's essentially what we're trying to do here. So I'll let you all kind of berate one another when it comes to that. I'm sort of a non-judgment zone. This is a circle of trust here. Same here. We, we, same. Yep. same here. We believe you drink it the way you want to drink it. You got it. I can just tell Matt's not putting it in a cocktail. No, no yeah. I'm not putting it in a cocktail. No, no. If you can do whatever the hell you want with it, but I'm not doing it. Oh, there oh. you go. That's all I'm saying. Matt was very expressive. He was like, oh, God. Yeah, he's yeah. over here just losing it. Yeah, he's kicking me under the table. Stop it. Yeah, he's kicking it. Like, no, it ain't no cocktail here. So do we want to give this a shot with our, our mac and cheese, or do we want to talk a little bit about the flavor profiles? I know you gentlemen have smelled it a little bit. You Have you sipped it yet? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I had, I had okay. to have yeah. Yeah. Agree with me here. Do we think that this is definitely something that sees a lot more of the flavor profiles that we're used to seeing with bourbons specifically? We've got our vanilla and a much more heavy presence on the nose and the palate of an oak. Van vanilla citrus, really. Got, yeah, and I do get the oak. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you oh. like this? I like this one. That's great. Yeah, and this is sort of, again, like if we're really talking about jumping into the swimming pool that is sherry season scotches, 
this is definitely that first step comfortably into the pool. We've got our double cask is more waiting, and then sherry oak is our deep end. I got to say something. I think you got a pool at home. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Listen, I talk about pools so much because it's the thing that I, that, that is when I know I've gotten to where I want to be. I'm always trying to get that swimming pool. Yeah, there's a lot of pools. There's like, oh, is it deep into the pool. Next to a pool, I'll probably get closer to it. I like it. I like it. Yeah, Scott's coming off the high dive on this one. Yeah. So if anyone <laughs> listening has maybe, um, I don't know, a concrete project, anything that they might, some shovels extra, we can make it a community effort. I got to get a pool so we can all drink whiskey <laughs> next to it. Yeah. Yes. All right. So what we're pairing with this, and I know that this is an interesting cheese. Not a lot of people love it. I actually haven't always enjoyed it myself, but it's become one of my favorite cheeses, and that's a blue cheese. Something that's going to have a heavy salt, a uh, very, very creamy mouthfeel, and a lot of bit of funk, right? And what's going to happen here is this is definitely not sort of a synergic pairing. This is more of a contrasting pairing. What we're going to see here is the nature of the cheese cut through a lot of the... Um, sort of sweet and oaky flavors and it's going to leave us with a again a shorter finish um but a completely different whiskey on the back end so do you enjoy blue cheese i don't know we're gonna find out do it for the feed <laughs> jump in man you're gonna do it jump sure. into the deep wow. into the pool matt also by the way josh galladay showed up from cast train so he's here so all right hey josh Woo, josh hey josh come get in the screen real quick yeah get in the screen matt's getting in the pool <laughs> jump into the pool no one wants to see that <laughs> Josh, what's going Josh, on? Josh, hey, what's going on? Good to see you. I just yeah, came from Iron Root Republic, so just came straight here from over there. So, yeah, good to see you guys. Glad we're hanging out. out with the Licorice Brothers. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Was Marsha over there? Yeah, uh, she told us the most amazing story. Did she steal anything from you? Is the real question. <laughs> oh yeah, Marsha will steal stuff from me. You. you come up, you'll be missing like a pocket knife. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were incredibly generous, and we had a we had a great time. So it was yeah. a lot of fun. Awesome. Welcome. Yeah, thank We're you. We're excited to have you all. Thank you. So, what do we think about the whiskey sandwich? How are we feeling about the spirit on the back end of this tasting? I actually like it. It's actually good. It's great. This is something that... It doesn't suck, so that's nice. <laughs> it doesn't suck. I don't think it'll ever suck with McAllen, but... Not the whiskey, the cheese. The cheese yeah. doesn't suck. It he doesn't. was nervous. And this is more of um, an approachable, easy pointer for a blue cheese. You don't have to go super funky. You don't have to get something that's too briny. Really what we want to do is just sort of get the essence of what that cheese is going to give us. It's a super creamy nature. It's got sort of a tangy, weird sensation. It's almost kind of um, sour like a citrus as well. And that's going to pair with the flavor profiles here. But what, it, what it's going to do is kind of cut through it. So yeah. we're, seeing, uh, we're seeing what's left for me in my mouth is a little bit of uh, sweetness at the front, some custard, some more like maybe butterscotchy sensations. Um, but there is some spice and oak that's left as well. I think that in the in the end, it just sort of lets us see this whiskey through a different lens, if you that will. That is interesting. I get a lot of custard cream. Mm -hmm. I would have to, I would not have thought of pairing blue cheese with a lighter whiskey. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's almost like a bomb of flavor with something that's a little more delicate, but you know, we sort of find really great partnerships through those sorts of relations. So when we have a lighter whiskey, I make it a point to try when I'm at home. If you really want to know what I do, I try one of each with all of them. So that's probably why I pass out with like brine, brines of cheese all around me. Uh, and why I need to join three gyms, but it's uh, it's all in it's all in um, you know the name of education and exploration. So that's right. Hey, I try cheese. one of each with each cheese. It's gonna you know. Pinpoint your palate in different ways. There's really cheese no wrong way good to for you. Double up on the cheese and skip the carbs. You don't need to go to the gym. Yeah, we've got a basket of crackers over here, and I can't reach it, which is yeah. great. No, no, Matt, don't. No. No, no. Matt, go for the bacon, Matt. Go for the bacon. Yeah, yeah the, the bacon is awesome. kind of the new, it's the new vessel for the cheese. You just throw it right on. You don't need any, any bread. That's perfect. I got a little sausage here. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. Scott knows I usually don't like to eat when we do shows. The problem isn't eating. The problem is you don't know when to stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, here's the deal. You guys don't know this. When you come over to Scott's house, he's also like a little bit of a chef. Oftentimes when I come over, I make sure I'm on an empty stomach. And then I'm like, I'm a little hungry. Whip me up <laughs> something in the kitchen, Scott. Right. Well, we did a couple of shows where we would pair something with the whiskey, and so we'd have it out. And yeah. I, I would be thinking, okay, we'll just like take a couple mm -hmm. little nibbles. I'm like, whatever. yeah, and then I'm distracting the viewers with like my he literally, yeah, inhale. Yeah, it's like it's dinner time, baby. The dinner time. Plate of whatever's out. 
Right. That's what the true cowbell is for is to call Bart to dinner, huh? It's dinner time, baby. <laughs> More cowbell. More cowbell. So we're moving into classic cut, right? Mm, we do it. Do it. More like that one. Yeah. You need to reach for yep. it. Look at that. He's got a little McCallum shelf. Can you see him? It's perfect. Sorry, I got a block. Big chair. I'll get it out of there. Just having a hard time. Mm, hold on. There you go. Look at that. Bart's trying to help. He isn't. I'm helping. I'm just eating. Now, this is uh, the 2017 edition of the. So you've got 2017 and we've got 2018. Ooh. So really what we're seeing here is a variance in octane. Um, our proof changes quite a bit, and that's something that's important. We're dating these expressions. These are also collectible opportunities for an approachable price point like we see with the edition series. Um, essentially, this bottle won't cost you a pretty penny. You're not going to have to turn your pockets out. What's, what's your proof? You're, you're in a better boat. You've got, what, 58.4? Yeah. And I've got 51.2. Hello. So there's variance here in Octane. Keep your eyes peeled on the yearly release. It's going to change. That's part of the collectability of it. But it's also so that you know that this isn't something that is supposed to be standard across its uh, uh, its release. So oh, no. this is essentially, and it was before my time, but there was an uproar in the McCallum community about the release of a class or a cast strength and then the the pull back on a cast string. So what this expression is, although it is not a single cask, this is a uh, sort of an idea that we're creating something of a higher proof with a robust and complex, complex flavor profile that will remind us, if anything, of that, that single cask expression. So we've got an overproof Macallan here, which is not generally what we're used to seeing. Um, and as someone that's been a bartender and someone that enjoys all sorts of whiskeys, not only whiskey that's scotch, but everywhere in the world and anything beyond it and spirits types i see overproof things and mainly in a rum sort of scenario right we're looking at tiki drinks or those sorts of things and when i love a good overproof spirit is when it doesn't lose the backbone of what it's supposed to be um there's a lot of times that we're blasted with octane that the proof itself takes the front we're burned completely out on our palates and we're left with something that is not reminiscent of what we truly thought we were getting into this is a spirit that i can say as someone that drinks um across the boards that I'm incredibly pleased with, I'm impressed with. Honestly, when I tried it first, um, I, I questioned what I was going to get into and what I have here is something that, yeah, it's hot. Yes, of course it's hot. It's gonna hit you like a freight train, but it's not gonna lose its essence. You're gonna get your flavor. You're, you're getting a ton of sweetness up front. You get your sherry seasoned uh, sort of flavor profiles as well. Um, and you have a long lustrous sort of uh, finish it's it's incredible we also know that it doesn't lose its viscosity because of that that cut that we talked about earlier Ooh, yeah. yeah this is one where you you know you really need to and anyone at home that's smelling and tasting it's really really imperative that you part your lips when you are when you're smelling a spirit this is going to allow you to smell through your nose breathe out through your mouth you're releasing those alcohol vapors that would otherwise oxidize on your palate and keep you from tasting anything else so there's sort of an etiquette to it it's not really to to know that you're a professional it's to keep yourself safe if you really want to drink your whiskey and taste it part your lips breathe in your nose out your mouth this is also something where when we talk about most of the expressions we've tasted already i don't generally think they need a lot of dilution i don't necessarily think they need to be on ice i think they're okay on their own but again i'm a little bit more seasoned of a drinker with this one, though, I like to say we introduce the whiskey chew. This is where you're going to take a sip, move it all the way around your palate, let it completely coat from front to back, and then your second expression or your second uh, sip to your lips is where you're really going to get the flavor profile. So we initially shock our mouths, chew it around. It allows your, your uh, saliva to actually naturally dilute the whiskey as well, and then we can follow it back up. I think we've got a cowboy, cowbell on the horizon. You gentlemen are looking at, at some questions. Not a cowbell yet. Claire the Third, when he talks, we <coughs> listen. We listen to Claire the Third. But he got straight off into the uh, Elijah Craig barrel proof. It uh, confused me for a second. My fault. That's okay. <laughs> He's the same. Heaven Hill barrel all the time. Different. Or you always use the same whiskeys from Heaven Hill. Um, I think we use the same maybe two or three expressions. Okay. Um, but we're not just grabbing anything. You know that at Heaven Hill, they make brandy oh, as yeah. well. You know, so we're seeing all, all sorts of spirits coming out of Heaven Hill. Matt asked me if there was a strategic partnership with expressions, uh, ex, you know, ex 
exclusive expressions out of Heaven Hill. I do believe that we operate with three of the bourbons that come out of that, that mm -hmm. distillery, but they are exclusive bourbon barrels. We're not looking at anything that maybe had uh, the brandy that they're well known for making as well in it or anything like that. So. The other thing Wes Jolly's on. He's out of uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Mm. Good, good fellow. It's cold up there. I hope he's got some whiskey in hand. <laughs> I guarantee it. He's a Stranahan snowflake guy, right? Oh, yeah. I would say, <laughs> yeah, Stranahan's Cab Calloway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. What do we think about the classic cut? It's the best. I one. love it. Yeah. Yeah. You really, guys, I'm really getting good. thumbs up this around the room. Awesome. Is everyone here have an opportunity mm -hmm. to try it? This is fantastic. Awesome. Um, and it's sort of, again, it's not it's, it's not a single cast, but what it is is a conversation close to it is what we're getting is some, and it's important about the McCallum, we don't talk about single cast types or even an age statement, is what we're doing is we're really getting to see our whiskey masters creating a whiskey that's complex and beautiful outside of a, um, out of a confine, right? So we're essentially unshackling them to create something that is robust and new. So when we don't see an age statement, it doesn't mean it's not as good. It just means that we've given someone creative freedom. Same goes for the classic cut. It's supposed to get us close to what we would experience with their cast strength from prior years before. But again, it's sort of an investigation at the hands of our masters. Wow. Yeah, that's phenomenal. Awesome, right? But be very careful. I heed warning. We have two of the same whiskeys at different years. It's important, again, for collectability purpose. Also, to remember that there is going to be inconsistencies with the octane and flavor profile. Um, but what we're seeing here is you guys are probably going to get uh, a little bit more, you know, Mark. waxed yeah. over, essentially. So they're, they're sitting uh, a little higher in octane right here with the uh, the 2018 release, we have 51.2. Uh, our friends here have 58.4 with the 2017 release. So keep your eyes peeled on not only that denotion of, of change in year and collectability, but also look at the things like Octane that are going to be changing as well. All right. Cool. And Jason I Whiskey Wise is with us. He says he's enjoying it, just relaxing before bed. It's pretty late cool. out, out in his area, he's, isn't it? Yeah, he's he's in London. Isn't he London? Yeah. No, it's incredibly late. Thank you for joining us. You are you may as well stay up to see the sunrise, right? What are we seven hours, eight hours difference? Well, I think we're six, six maybe seven with, six. with London. Okay. Well, yeah. clearly I'm not very good at time or math. Oh, you're all right. You're all right. <laughs> it's fine. He's in the future though, and that's important. <laughs> that's right. So do we uh does anyone have do you guys have any questions over McAllen? Anything that we can talk about before we dive into Highland Park? I know that we're kind of on a timeline here, but I want to milk this thing as as far as we can go. Mm. A question did come up early on about McAllen and the and the new corks, mm. and I know you, we talked about it before we went live. But they, you do have the kind of the hybrid is the cork and the screw, yeah. or the quarter turn screw cap. Right. Has, has McAllen looked at synthetic corks at all? Are they sticking with wood with cork? You know, I can't. I can't. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. That's sort of a an entire different realm when it comes to it. I know that through my experience with drinking other spirits, that this is sort of a change we're seeing, especially with our sister brand Highland Park. We've got that kind of quarter screw and a cork. I think that there's something about a cork and a change. Is it's always been in our our you know, packaging, it's kind of the classic way in which we've corked and contained our spirits. So a change like that, although it probably won't effective liver profile. I think consistency is always key with things like the McAllen. So uh, don't change it if you don't need to. Um, I, I personally collect all of my corks from, from my whiskey. So, you know, I enjoy that it stayed the same. I will tell you that I, and, and maybe some of you out there are having a difficult time as well. Some of the new packages are a little bit hard to crank uh, open. It's not going to be an easy sort of tug of a, of a cap. You do have to twist it. So what I would say is maybe just shimmy it back and forth. Make sure that you're really breaking that plastic uh, seal and then give it a good twist. I've also had to, you know, um, go do a few push-ups and then come back to it later when I felt a little bit more beefed up or <laughs> ask uh, a strong friend. So if you are having a hard time getting the cork off, you're not alone. Uh, it's probably something that we'll see some ease given uh, as the package kind of becomes more um, available. It's a sort of a guinea pig run. So with most things, it gets ironed out. Now, Matt, I got to ask, there's a fellow with a great beard that just put a bottle on a shelf back there. We got to know his name. That's William. William. William with the beard. Phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> his, good, sir. his beard is great, but William uh, and his and his wife are also the reason that we have this tremendous bacon in front yeah. of us. So oh, I can tell. William Brock. That beard makes bacon. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It probably keeps his face from getting scorched with any popped grease, too. So smart guy. Smart. Hey, two two quick questions before we move on to Highland Park. Jason Whiskey Wise wants to know when edition five is going to be released. Don't we all, Jason? Oh. And Welsh Toro wants to know why Classic Cut is not available in the UK. Um, that's a great question. Honestly, it's from my, so you're talking to a little old me in Texas. Um, I have had the opportunity and the privilege to study international spirits. However, what I don't really have a complete grip on is T, the TBT and, and the rules that happen when we're talking about releasing uh, spirits across not only the globe, but in different parts of the world. You know, we see variants in age statement ability. We see variants in octane or proof. Um, that isn't something that I have the answer to right now, but uh, again, I'm going to give everyone my information towards the end, and I'm committed to finding that answer for you. Um, and if anything else, maybe we can find someone that can send you a little dram or two, uh, and you can experience it for yourself. Um, but, I mean, that even being said is you, I will say that you have access in the UK to some of the things that we don't, which are phenomenal uh, expressions of the Macallan. So let's just chalk it up to, to tit for tat. And when you come to visit, we'll give you a pour. And when we're out there, I hope to see some maybe of the quest range or bring something. It to us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Problem. Yeah. If he comes out here to get a pour, he's got to bring the, the unique. Yeah, yeah. Brings them with you. I mean, that's yeah. the requirement. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I get really spoiled. I was telling Matt earlier that when I do get to travel, I, you know, pack up like a mule when I'm coming through duty free and yes. All, yes. Uh, all across the line, you know, I have access to some of the Nika and the Japanese whiskey that I really mm -hmm. love. But we also have, you know, in duty free and, and travel retail exclusively, there's a range of the Macallan called the Quest range that is some of the most complex and delicious things. So I would suggest that in the meantime, if you can't quite find classic cut or some of these expressions that are exclusive to North America, do do investigate the other things that you are a, a little more fortunate to have. You bet. Well, Toro William's going to hook you up with some bacon. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm saying. William's going to be in the show now. William's yeah. William, then. William wants to be the William bacon man. Then. <laughs> all right, we're moving on to the Highland 12. Do it. Let's do it. So when I think about McAllen and I think about Highland Park, and I know that there's people from all over the states and now the world that are watching, um, is when I think of the McAllen, I think of this sort of conversation around the, per the perfection of production, right? We painstakingly create this whiskey that is uh, incredible, but it's all around sort of refined production. Not to say that Highland Park isn't, but what I love about Highland Park, again, going back to that conversation that I love to have with cultures and history and time, is that it's a conversation of um, the investigation of, of place and people. It's not so much about how it's made, it's about who makes it and why. Um, that, just to touch on it, a brief history of uh, Highland Park. Highland Park was founded in 1798. This isn't necessarily the year that the distillery was built. This is the year that our founder, Magnus Jensen, was caught by the Federales. Uh, what I mean by that is he was a bootlegger, an illicit distiller, and a clergyman by day. And he wasn't, you know, uh, you know, it wasn't sort of Jekyll and Hyde situation. He was strategically like used the basement of the church in order to uh, smuggle his his whiskey. So all around, yeah. let's say Magnus is a badass, of cloth, baby man of the cloth. Yeah, he's a badass, but this is sort of an indicative nature of Highland Park as a brand. Um, I mean that to, to talk about it culturally for a moment. Uh, it's the northernmost distillery in Scotland. It is part of a um, slew of 70 islands of sort that are thrown out into the North Sea, um, not all of which are inhabited and not all of which are safe to be. Um, Orkney itself is a, it's part of this sort of archipelago, right? And closer to Orkney and thinking about 1798, when all of this was happening, these people have been here for thousands of years. Um, there's a lot of geographical boundaries to this day to get to Orkney. You have to get there by um, boat or by plane and um, a big heavy dose of, of uh, goodwill. Uh, it's a dangerous place to get to, but it makes it more fun all the same, right? But imagine being in 1798, you're probably not going to try your, your, your best at getting across the Grampian Mountains and really associating yourself with more of the established areas and populated areas of Scotland. That being said, closer to Orkney than anything in Scotland is Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. Mm. And for 5,000 years, um, the, the area of Orkney has been culturally influenced and even owned by um, a Danish sort of, and, and Viking sort of culture and, um, and more of a 
lifestyle, if you will. So closer to that in proximity than it is to um, to actual populated Scotland. So if we can think about that being said, these people have been trained um, in sort of a mindset that they are an extension of um, this Norse sort of region. So one of each, or I think one of five inhabitants on Orkney can directly be DNA related to um, Viking uh, descendancy. So it's pretty incredible. We see a change in packaging with the Highland Park over the last couple of years. We see an introduction of beveling with this beautiful Celtic design. We've partnered with a Danish artist named Dan Lingfield, and he has essentially created this beautiful imagery to tell slowly and, and start introducing this Viking spirit that we're trying to sort of communicate through the Highland Park. Um, that being said, I love talking about it as a Texan. Um, I believe that in Texas, and agree with me or don't, but we sort of live with this disposition um, and belief that if it's not getting done, you do it yourself, right? It's almost a hard-headed nature. We are first to respond in our communities to disaster. We are the first to help a neighbor build a fence, those sorts of things. We work with the resources we're given. And even so, the same can be said about island communities. It's why I love to travel to the Caribbean and so on and so forth, is when you're talking about an island, you're talking about um, limitation and you're talking about um, perseverance and, and innovation around limitation. So that's exactly what we're talking about with Highland Park. I mean to say this because it is our peated expression, going back to whoever is joining us that's ready to get to the peat town, here we are, population us. Um, Highland Park is special in the sense that it doesn't really remind us of our favorite peated scotches, whether it's Islay or beyond. It's not that sort of briny, really, really heavily peated. When you're talking about your PPI or your phenol parts, that's the amount of peat that you have post distillation. It isn't off the chain, it's not off the scale. We're not talking Richter here talking about lightly peated or delicately peated, but something in the nature of the peat in Orkney is very different. Um, we, we don't grow trees on Orkney because of the gale force winds of the North Sea that pummel through our, our foliage. So it would never allow trees to ever exist here. But what does grow um, with, with um, you know, sort of this enduring nature is heather. And Heather is a sort of floral shrub. Um, it's got a sweet floral tendency to it when it decomposes into peat. Peat is that um, biomass. It's a brick of ground that we've, through time, realized burns um, faster and longer and stronger than things like coal and, fire and wood. And in areas like Ireland or Scotland, where that is your, your fire source, you, you are familiar with peat. But peat is a piece of earth that we create into bricks, and we use that to malt our barley. So what we're doing is we're implementing smoke into the barley through our smoking pagodas while we're churning our, our malt, which will also bring me to one of the keystones of Highland Park. To this day, it is hand turned. So when we think about the strength of the arms and the backs of our employees, it's a dedication to um, a process that is indicative of, you know, the quality of what we expect with Highland Park. Um, but so it's sort of more of a romantic conversation with people in place. To me, it's also, you know, right there with it the, with, um, oh, wow. We have Pete here. Nice. Amazing. That's how Matt starts a fire. No, please. <laughs> well, it'll burn forever and we'll all be gone. But this is sort of, if you can all see, this is a, a piece of peat. If you imagine in whiskey production, we will shovel this out um, into sort of bricks and those bricks are used. And the peat that we're using at Highland Park, again, we're stuck on this island, um, are very, very close to home. We get them from Hobbister Moor, which is just a stone's throw from the distillery. Um, and that is sort of where we're getting our peat. Again, we're hand churning our barley um, and we are smoking our pagodas with that peat rather than our lumber because trees don't grow there. But indicative to our peat is that heather. And the heather is going to give us that floral honey sensation. And it breaks down over time in the peat. It's going to implement itself naturally into that barley and it's going to get. Uh oh. My little. Do we lose them? Uh oh. Oh boy. All right. Hold on. Uh, we may have lost them. I was just getting ready to say I want William to take out a bacon skillet and then heat the bacon. Oh, wait, there you go. We're the peat. You can oh. bacon wash whiskey if you didn't know that. You can fat wash They whiskey. made the cork right on this thing. The you, cork and the how, screw work perfect. You want to know perfect. how to do it? You take your baking drippings or your butter, anything that's melted into a liquid form, you pour it into a bucket with your whiskey. I'd say bucket. Maybe you have a, a nice container in your kitchen because we aren't in, in our backyards or the woods. So, uh, <laughs> If you have any kind of a, a container, 
pour it all together, put it into the freezer, allow that fat to coagulate and freeze, skim it right off the top, and you now have a fat washed whiskey for those at home if you wanted to do it. So maybe we'll put Will to work later. You can fat wash the whiskey for us. Yeah, like he'll, just, he'll do some beard filtering. Yeah. Yeah. So let's <laughs> let's give this thing a, a, a smell. What do we think? We have it in our hands, right? We can see that this is beautiful amber color, just as the standard exists for the Macallan. 100% of the color is coming from our casks. What we're seeing here is a uh, proportion of American and European sherry season casks. They are built at the Tavasa uh, Cooperage, just that we see with the Macallan. Um, but what we smell initially is slight peat, lots of honey, good amount of oak. I got salt, salty peat, slight peat. Yeah, is, you know, the first time I had Highland Park, I didn't, I didn't get any peat in it at all, and I think I had told people that there wasn't peat in Highland Park, or it was very faint. But and that was early, early right. on. And that's because I was hitting but, you with the Isla peat. But even now, when I sip, and I've already taken a sip, but the peat is there. I oh, mean, yeah. it's present. You could, but it's not like you say. It's You're not right. a peat blast. It's that heather peat. It's just a a nice light uh, peat with with honey citrus notes right. yeah tons of citrus tons yeah. of honey there's sort of a balance of sweetness um and fruitness and fruit flavors that balance out that peat and honestly again when we're talking about the scale of phenol parts we aren't really up there in the system with the big dogs we aren't your lagavulin we're not your lafroy we aren't trying to be octomore this is something that should be beautifully and um and delicately balanced it's kind of a, a better conversation for what we have on the island it's just mm -hmm. delicious that's all it comes down to it is. It's, it's just beautiful. Salty honey peat. It's beautiful. Yep. Yeah. Again, this is a you know this is a great opportunity to introduce people mm. to a peated scotch. You know, once we get through so the good. sherry season scotches, we eventually get into our peat and training our peat palates. And this is a phenomenal um, you know backbone. This is a great, not only a good starter, but this is a really great um, sort of standard. I think. I, I have an easy time getting people on board with eat, drinking peat when I introduce them to Highland Park. We've got uh, the Volk not in front of you right now, right? Yep. Yes, the brand new. Our series. Yeah. And a couple of years ago, I guess, and we've been in the works now since 1617, we've released um, a three-part series, yeah. which goes alongside of Magnus. Magnus is sort of um, uh, our newer non-age statement release, a lower octane. It comes in a black bottle. It looks like that. That is brand new and will remain in the core range of the Highland Park. So if you haven't tried it, don't rush out to get it, but definitely get yourself some. It isn't going anywhere, um, unlike the Valkyrie and the Volk Knot, and which will be our third um, edition, uh, Valhalla. Ooh, yeah. so here with our Viking Honor series, we are essentially looking at um, our, our Viking Pride series. We're looking at this conversation about culture through three different types of whiskey, right? Um, so we have Volhalla, which uh, Bart's got in his hands now, and then we're trying Volk Knot, which is our newest release, secondary release. If I can give you just a little brief uh, intro to what these words are telling us of uh, Valkyrie, um, we're, we're kind of creating a story for you that goes along with these transitions and whiskey expressions, um, and it's about Norse mythology. Again, we're bringing ourselves back to this Viking heritage. Um, the Valkyrie were the women that would scour the um, battlefields and select the most honorable um, fighters and to then ascend to Valhalla to perform in Thor's, you know, uh, eternal battle and feast. So we have the Valkyrie was the introduction. Initially, what we have is seemingly a higher percentage of peat. There is a larger proportion of peated malt in this um, and a higher octane as well. Um, if we're looking at 40% being the line, uh, we're at 45.9. For the, I, wanted, uh, I just wanted to say real quick, Elise, that every morning Bart's wife gets up and she scours the house for a man. <laughs> she can't find one. Bart, you right. married a Valkyrie. You are lucky. More like a demigod. <laughs> <laughs> so we have Port here, our Vulcan. Is that right, Matt? Yes. That's <laughs> <it>. <laughs> oh, we got Hoyt Hempel. Very informative, folks. But now I'm hungry. For bacon. Yeah, for some bacon, for some William bacon. Well, come on over. We won't save you much, but come on. So no, what we have here with the Volk Knot is essentially a secondary conversation. The Volk Knot is the tribal tattoo, if you will, the marking upon um, the most honorable of fallen uh, 
soldiers in battle. And so really this is another investigation of cast combinations and um, sort of production of Highland Park. What we're seeing with this is an introduction of a portion of Orkney grown tart and barley, which um, because we know that the soil has a bunch of heather in it, we know that that peat is where it's growing. It inherently has a smoky quality to it. Um, and it's going to have sort of a little bit more of sweetness, in my opinion. I think that something about that combination of malted barleys um, give us, it gives a really, really rich uh, honey flavor. Um, but it's also incredibly, uh, it's incredibly more beefed up. We're looking at 46.8 coming off of 45.9 for the Valkyrie. So again, you're getting a little bit more um, bang for your buck, if you will. The octane is up there. Um, but all, all what we know, especially from things like wine, is the higher the octane, the more flavor profile is going to come with it, right? It's going, those alcohol vapors are going to act as a ship or sort of a vessel for our flavor profile. So with a higher proof, we're getting a little bit more robust complexities and flavor. Well, that is good. That what do you is think? Good. It's oh, great. That's delicious. I want to throw out to yeah. Tom R that the uh, the fat and the cheese isn't what gives you pounds. It's actually the uh, glucose and the carbs. You say he thinks I'm going to get fat because I'm eating all the cheese. Oh well, will you beat him with science? Does that Dang mean it. I can eat more cheese and no carbs and be fine? Mm -hmm. No, you definitely can. Right. I don't know why I don't trust you. Oh, you need to trust. <laughs> All right. Well, like, is there a is there a sherry in and, and I'll just you know I'll be happy how I am as long as I've got whiskey I don't care what I look like. <laughs> is, is there is there sherry on the valve? Yeah, okay, cheers around the room. Cheers. Cheers to whoever you are as long as you have whiskey. Now, what was your are question? There, is there is there sherry on the uh, valve nut? Um, this is going to be yeah, but we're seeing a high proportion of American oak. This is sherry season casks. Um, but we're seeing, again, that shift in a higher proportion of American oak. So that oak quality is there. Those vanillins and bur those vanillins and uh, cinnamons and fresh citruses are kind of piggybacking on the sweet nature of the peat um, that goes into the barley. It goes into, obviously, you know, the spirit of its, uh, its itself. So we're seeing sort of more of a um, sweet combination here with the oak and the uh, the honey and the heather and the peat. I actually got a roasted, the, uh, the the salted roasted peanut. The first thing I got on this on the nose was the salted roasted peanut, which usually I get with a lot of heavily peated stuff. Sure. That's good. Yeah, uh, there's a little salinity in it. And I don't know if that's from, you know, the casks making a trip and a journey from by sea or if it's something that happens through the winds on Orkney. Um, but I think that it's something we see in a lot of peated yeah. expressions as being right there on the edge of the water, right on the rim of land and water, you're going to pick up some salinity. Yeah, that's very tasty. By the way, Bird Dog says, quote, in Bart we trust. In Bart we do trust. <laughs> Somebody else said Keto Master. Oh, that was Moose 76. He does like bacon. What can you say? He's a you can't go wrong with bacon and cheese. I'm just telling you. I don't think that anyone drinking whiskey can remain in ketostasis, but if he is finding a balance, please send your nutritional advice my way. Um. I'll try better. I'll try to be better. You're okay, good. so that's the first tasting I've had with the with the bulk nut. Um, more, I mean, there's it's a medium. I'd say a medium peat, a lot of vanilla, um, honey. Gcap wants to know which cheese would go best with the bulk nut. I'm saying the blue cheese goes great. I would say also this this uh, Gruyere, where you have some of that nutty, salty, creamy flavor profiles, that's probably going to really, really enhance the sweet honey aspects of it, while probably leaving you with um, a little bit of that higher burn with that finish, a little bit more of that lingering finish. Uh, we'll take care of that. But again, you can't really go wrong. Um, there's going to be some some discovery with anything that you're pairing this with, especially with cheeses. It's, it's something of the combination of the creaminess and the mouthfeel with the, the milk. Um, and then obviously whatever salty or sweet nature the cheese holds will affect the whiskey. Mm. I brought out and I brought out some sour notes with the cheese. Really? Yeah. Mm. Ooh. Yeah. With the Gruyere. Yeah. You haven't been hitting wow. the Gruyere as much. The what? Gruyere. That's my favorite one. You all are eating it? Uh uh. It, it's not getting touched as much. I mean, it's getting touched. It's not as much. Yeah. Touch it. <laughs> Bart likes touch cheese. What can we say? <laughs> yeah, touchable cheese is what Bart likes to say. All right. Yeah. What do we got? 18? Oh, we're still we're still milking the vault nut. Gentlemen, do you have any questions over this expression? Again, this is going to be the second in a three-part release. 
Over time, we're essentially introducing you to the conversation of the Viking culture through the Viking spirit range, the Viking pride range, um, and essentially keep your eyes peeled for next year's release of Valhalla. This was uh, this hit the market a little bit sooner than I anticipated. It came out rather than August. It was somewhere around June or July, depending on the market you're in. Um, but again, it's in high demand. It is collectible, and it is it's incredibly price point of approachable. So get it while the getting's good. We don't have the 18, so if you guys move on to that, you're on your own. Yep. But go, oh, okay. feel free. Get it. If you want to talk, yeah, yeah. Oh, what else that. do you have over there? Uh, the just these goes. that I got up here, and All then right. I've got. Oh. Oh well, we don't have that. I don't have it. We can really talk about it. I don't even know. <laughs> the dark. Is that the, that's seventeen? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So this is um one I'm not so trained in drinking. Um, I haven't really been fortunate enough to get my hands on a lot of it, but if you all want to pour it and, and taste it, let's go ahead and taste through it. Oh, if it was, if it it was opened, I would. Yeah, he has oh. not opened it yet. Okay, well then let's <laughs> just leave it at go and get some and drink it. Again, this is an incredibly price point affordable. Um, this is going to be a conversation of cast combinations, 17 year old. Uh, so we have the, this is the, the dark. Um, there's a very... You opened it. You talked right. to me. Good, good, because we want to. We want to know what you're tasting down here. We don't yeah, have that I one. Have to rinse a couple glasses. Here, my water one. Water. Water one. I've got to work in water. I like to hydrate. We'll just keep drinking. Last <laughs> cup of water. Well, I didn't want the pink cup on the camera. How's chance? Let's do that. A blend again. Yes. So you know, I like I that plan. Mm. Not in the core range specifically through the Viking Pride. So we've got a question here in the room: Is are we moving towards non-age statements with Highland Park? Mm. We will always have the core range, just like we see with McAllen. There's going to be side projects, side opportunities to sort of innovate and create complex whiskey. So the Viking Pride range, so your Valhalla, your Val, your Valknot, and your Valkyrie will be an investigation of that with a higher octane. Your Magnus, which is here. Is going to be an introduction that will remain in the core range in a non-age statement. But other than that, these are just sort of fun collectible quips that will help us tell the story of the new brand, uh, essentially the brand identity that we see visually, the bottle changes, and really kind of get everybody on board with what Highland Park is trying to uh, create. Although we are creating, obviously, whiskey in Scotland, we, we as a people, and I say we because I'm fortunate to represent the brand, um, Orkney truly believes itself to be more culturally driven and influenced by um, Viking culture through the last 5,000 years. I mean, all the way up to where Denmark was owned Orkney and it ended up falling back into the island's hands through a wedding uh, dowry is, is fascinating information. But so it's sort of an opportunity for the people at, that are making the whiskey have a conversation about their narrative. Wow. Tell me what you're getting on this nose. Uh, I, I need to let it open a little bit. We little just bit. literally just opened it. I got some, um, uh, some beautiful oak. Um, what is, I almost wanted to say like hints of an, of a nice spice tea. A lot of spice. Yeah. A lot of spice. Yeah. So we're seeing a European oak, uh, sherry cask influence here. Obviously a longer time in, in yeah. cask is going to give you some more richness and color, obviously more complexity and flavor profile as well. I'm getting, yeah, more of the Oloroso dark sherry notes. I think more of the dates, the plums, raisins. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting, right? Like when we see European oak with other with other expressions of whiskey, we would imagine, yes, we're going to find their flavor profiles. But with the things that are peated, usually the peat takes the front burner and uh, the rest mm -hmm. fall behind. But this is, again, another opportunity or another sort of... Oh, that's good. Oh, my. <laughs> there's, a, there's a balance to be found. Ooh. Definitely something beautiful to be found. I'm in with Amy mm -hmm. here. Amy's saying press like, please. I thank you, Amy, and subscribe while you're at. Absolutely. You Definitely do that. What about any more comment co questions? We've got a few more minutes, and I would love to get any questions that anyone has plugged in. That is, uh, Claire phenomenal. was asking how much that was. I actually picked that one up for two sixty. Wow, it, it's a little bit more price point yeah. uh, heavy, but it's not. It's not going to, yeah, you know. Zip it. We're all we're all drinking whiskey at our own pace and at our own uh, affordability. So, um, if it's something that you know maybe it becomes more of a collector's item in most people's cabinet, it's not surprising, but. Again, I live in the belief that the bottle itself is a celebration. Amy, you have friends here that have a bottle. Get over there and drink it. 
Mm-hmm. Now, this one came out also. There was this, so this is the 17 Year of the Dark. You also released, or Highland Park released, the, yeah. the light, 17 Year of the Light. Right. Yeah. So we have conversations about those cast combinations, proportions of American oak versus European oak, right? Like we learned earlier is that your flavor profiles, your color, everything's changing based on that oak species. So what we can really look at here is a study of American oak versus European oak, sherry season both, uh, you know, at a a higher age statement, right? So in in the bottle itself is really, really beautiful. Touching again there that this was a, a Danish artist named Dan Lingfield that created this really, really nice kind of sprawling Celtic sort of imagery. And I think, it, and I don't know, I, I know a lot of people and maybe you're listening and watching and if you have any questions over the packaging, we made sure that we talked about it earlier offline, but just to reiterate that the brand um, wanted an opportunity, the people that make the whiskey wanted an opportunity to tell their story through the simple interaction with the bottle. So that is what changed, but the juice itself is the same. Um, the new juice that we're seeing in, in the in the Viking Pride range, the Valkyrie, the Volknut, and the Valhalla, the Magnus as well, are just new sorts of ideas of, of experiencing those sorts of um, essentially cast combination conversations and flavor profiles that are coming. Well, and, and we're right at seven seven o'clock, and I know Matt wanted to try to wrap up about seven o'clock. You guys have another full tasting ahead of you yet tonight. Mm, magical. A uh, couple of uh, things real quick. Uh, yes, Claire, I think that was worth it to, at 260. Um, I know it's going even higher than that. 17 year, the dark, it's mm. 52.9%. It really was right out of the bottle and it's only going to open up and get better, I right. think. Um, and I know we still got some questions coming in, but I think we better wrap it up for you guys. Mm-hmm. And at least go ahead, put out your contact Please. details, show your card, do what yeah. you're going to do. Give me one second, time out. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You bet. We'll fill time. Just run away. So here's Highland Park Fire. Oh, Next look time. at that. Talk about it some more. Well, and there were three, I think three releases with that one. Weren't yeah, there? this was a while ago. I came on after this all came out, but I have the pr- privilege and pleasure of seeing it around market. Um, we have the Fire and Ice, obviously. Um, and these are all, all definitely going to be sort of stuck more in your high range collector's editions. Um, higher octane, same thing. We're essentially going to be seeing a 15 year old whiskey here. And it's a conversation about cast combinations. Um, it comes in this really, really beautiful package. It's sort of held together in this like, I don't, it's like, it's, wood it's wood magnetic. Wood. This, this beautiful sort of um, vessel. I can't really. Volcano. It's a, like a volcano. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. But the thing about this is obviously this falls into your more collector's range. This is if you can think about the Highland Park housing something like the McAllen's 1824 Master Series. This is sort of your your higher end. Oh um, yeah, they were thinking of Matt when they made that one. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. It's also a port. It's also finished in a port cask. Yes. Right. So I'm gonna put my my card up for everyone. Yep. And um. Maybe just don't don't call me a lot. Send a text message. <laughs> and my email address is really great as well. So if everyone can see that, can you all see that? Um, at least it's not clear enough to it's get. A your, bit. Oh, there we there go. We there go, we go. There, right there. All right, that's me. My name's Bleckman. It's German. Uh, it, it's weird. Right. Just as long as you don't call me Belchman, we'll be friends. There you go. <laughs> hey, you got a Brunschein here. I'm very German. Yeah, if you got my first and my last name written down, it's going to be a period between the two at edrington.com. My phone number is 713-540-7395. I know that that's a very bold thing to do. It is my personal phone number. <laughs> Don't uh, abuse this, please, because hopefully this is just something that we can all become better friends with. Again, Nobody's watching. Friends. Nobody's <laughs> tuning in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, hey, now, also, I know on the... Uh, on Instagram, you are uh, McAllen Elise. McAllen Elise. So at McAllen Elise, if you'd like to follow along with my story, it's something that's caught a little bit more wildfire. Or if you're ever drinking out in the market, there's a hashtag that I created that I really love to share. And it goes across my portfolio and into the other whiskeys that I love. And that is hashtag drink more single malt. Um, so you can follow along with my story. You can follow along in time with my uh, my website that we're creating. And it's sort of more of an opportunity for us to have more shareable conversation across not only Highland Park, McAllen, but getting into more of the scotches that we also love um, within my portfolio and beyond. Nice. 
All right. Well, thank you for thank joining you. us, Elise. Uh, Matt. Yeah. Appreciate thank it, guys. You, Matt. Well, once yep. again, you're running a heck of a deal there, Matt. We know you got more to come at your home base there. That's right. And yeah. for those watching, because I opened that, I can claim it on my taxes now. Oh, there so, you go. That's part yeah. of the ride off. Yeah, actually, there. we want to kind of bring everybody that's here with us around. Bring them in. Bring them in. All right. Everybody so, come to on you guys. I'll get closer up. Yeah. There we go. We got William. William. Oh, guys. Nice. <laughs> I'm not sure they're making beard. The bearded beard William. filtering the William. whiskey through the beard. Yes. Everybody squeeze in. Oh, look at that. Cindy. Cindy is there. <laughs> nice. All right. What do we say, Bart? Ah, uh, scotch it, you scotch gods. Cilantro. 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 Uh, there you go. See you guys. Have a great tasting. See you guys.